slight delay. So now we are having the free paper, cataract and refractive surgery, uh, the final uh, session. So I have Dr. Sudhakar Rao, sir, as uh, chairperson, and Dr. Nandakishore, sir, as the co-chair. I'm Dr. Madhavi. Uh, I'm the moderator. So let us go on to the papers right away. Uh, I yeah, the timing would be just a moment. Uh, five, five. Five minutes. Okay, uh, duration of each paper is uh, five minutes. Uh, the person who has uh, sent the abstract, the presenting author, please do not change that. And stick to your time. And the next speaker in line, please keep your presentation so that we don't waste time. So let us start right away. I think the first one is uh, Dr. Anup L. Is Dr. Anup here? Please remember that uh, there will be negative marking in case uh, you cross the time. So please stick to the time. Dr. Anup uh, is not there. So the second person would be Dr. Pranavi. Dr. Pranavi Dronavilli. Dr. Pranavi? Yeah, OK. So she is going to present on uh, comparison of IOL powers among different age groups undergoing cataract surgery. Oh Over to you, Pranavi. Good uh, afternoon. Just a moment, ma. The next person is Dr. Isha Gupta. You can please be ready with your paper. Yeah, carry on. So good afternoon, everybody. Today my paper is going to be about comparison of IOL powers among different age groups undergoing cataract surgery. Coming to introduction, according to the World Health Organization estimation in 2010, Proclaimed in Vision 2020, Global Initiative for Elimination of Avoidable Blindness 2020. There were about 285 million visually impaired people. Out of them, 39 million people were blind. And cataract is the major cause of blindness, about 51%. And it is responsible for one third of visual impairment, 33%. With increased age, very elderly, 65 years, are now expected to constitute higher percentage of patients undergoing cataract surgery. Older age has been associated with collagen structural changes impacting scleral fiber alignment, matrix stiffness, as well as stretching of anterior capsule and lens zonules. The final post-operative visual acuity is dependent on pre-existing corneal astigmatism, accurate biometry, IOL power calculation, and surgically induced astigmatism. The main determining factor to achieve desired refractive outcome is accurate measurement of axial length. The pre- and post-operative ultrasound biometry demonstrated that 54% of error is attributed to axial length measurement errors, 38% in estimation of post-operative anterior chamber depth, 8% to corneal power measurement errors. 1 mm error in axial length results in refractive error of 2.35 diopters in 23.5 mm I. If axial length is more than 25 mm, then stephyloma should be suspected. 1 diopter error in corneal power results in 1 diopter post-operative refractive error. Richard Settle found that Using the same surgical procedure and same calculation of IOL power, results are worse in women when compared to men. He recommended that special care is to be taken while implanting the lens in female patients, especially in measurement of accurate measurement of axial length. Since biometric indices can be influenced by gender, race, genetics, their differences across different population would help to determine the distribution of these parameters in different area. Coming to aims and objectives, it is to know the comparison of IOL power among patients attending tertiary care hospital for cataract surgery. This is a prospective-based study which is done from Jan 2023 to September 2023. A total of 430 patients were selected. Patients with associated pathology, previous ocular surgeries, glaucoma, axial length more than 25 mm and less than 18 mm were excluded. All patients have undergone complete ophthalmologic examination and SRK2 regression formula was used for calculation of IOL power. Out of 430 patients, 257 were females and 173 were males. Uh, this is the calculation of uh, age groups with uh, 51 to 60 years are predominant and females are predominant in all the age groups. Among 430 patients, the right eye were 185 and left eye were 245. The, compari the most common eyeball power is in the range of 18 to 23 diopters. And this is the comparison of axial length, eyeball power and K readings with age. As the age increases, there is increase in the K reading, IOL power, and decrease in the axial length. The mean IOL power noted was 25.7 uh, diopters, which is similar to study done in Nepal. The requirement of IOL is higher in males, higher in females than in males due to shorter axial length. And there is no difference between IOL powers noted and noted in uh, right and left eyes, which is similar to the study done in New Zealand. Coming to discussion, the uh, females present uh, the cataract surgery. The majority of the patients were in the age group of 51 to 60 years, followed by 61 to 70 years. 
Our findings are similar to study performed by Shaw Battle, who reported that the mean age of their uh, studied patients was 63 plus minus 10 years. This is also similar to the study made by Shori et al. In their study, 37% of patients fell in the age group for 50 to 60 years. The age of cataract operation varies from country to country. Example, in southern China, the mean age was 70 plus or minus 10 years. The mean age 64 plus or minus 10 years was reported by Natang et al. This implies cataract problem increases with age. Nirmal P. K. et al. also reported less number of cataracts are in males. However, Shoa et al. reported that the males are more males are more common than in females. Increased incidence of cataract in females is attributed to multiple factors like known nutritional status, confinement to household chores, which require near vision and cultural insensitivity. Coming to conclusion, in our, based on our study, it is concluded the commonest age group presenting with cataract is 51 to 60 years with female predominance, which is due to shorter axial length, and highest eyewall power noted was 61 to 70 years with no difference among right and left eyes. This is a comparison of age with mean eyewall power. As the age increases, there is slight increase in eyewall power due to change in the axial length and also keratometry reading. This study concludes that eyewall power requirement varies with age, gender, ethnicity, and calculation of eyewall power should be done with utmost care to avoid post-operative refractive errors. And these are some of my references. Thanks. Nice presentation. You have stuck on to the time also. So would you like to ask her some questions? SRK 2 here. Which machine? Uh, scan. What type scan, of? Upper scan. Okay. It's a, so it's a contact uh, ultrasound scan. Yes. So you did not compare with any other machine? It was no, ma'am. Only upper scan. Generally, I find that uh, your findings are slightly a little away from what we conventionally uh, seen in our prior practice over the last 30, 40 years. Uh, we don't see so much of, uh, I mean, you got 25.7 as the yes, power. Sir. We normally see in the range of 21.5 to 22. Very rarely we see 24 and above. So maybe we need to review that uh, study a bit and take a more uh, broad-based study. going to be Dr. Isha Gupta. She's going to talk on posterior optic capture versus in the bag implantation in of IOL in bilateral pediatric cataract. And the next uh, presenter is Dr. Siddharth Seth. Yeah, so please be ready. Good afternoon all. Sure. Thank you for your time. I'll be talking about comparison of two techniques from the surgeon's perspective and refractive outcomes. There are no financial discourses and all concerns were taken appropriately. So the, by this study, the most dreaded complication of a pediatric cataract surgery is visual access opacity technician as a recurrent VAO can lead to intractable amblyopia in the child. With a longer life expectancy, we do expect LECs to grow and uh, cover the visual axis. So a uh, standard in the bag IOL implantation, although has an initial barrier effect, it also has a delayed secondary barrier failure due to some rings. But a posterior optic capture of a multi-piece IOL through the PPCC with anterior vitrectomy does not allow these LECs to grow out of the uh, capsule complex and it is limited to the sandwich capsules. But can this be done easily in all cases? That was our main concern. So we evaluated the intraoperative challenges and the post-operative outcomes of these two uh, techniques. It uh, we did an ongoing prospective uh, longitudinal intervention study from September 21 for bilateral congenital cataracts. We included all the children which were diagnosed with bilateral developmental cataracts between the ages of two to eight years. And both eyes were operated with between uh, within an interval of two weeks. Follow-up was done up till 24 months. So we, uh, what we did was to remove the confounding uh, factors of propensity of patients to develop VAO. We uh, implanted in the bag eye in one eye, the first eye, and the group two was second eye in which we did a optic capture of a multi-piece eye oil. This was a surgical technique. Uh, Gimbel has described five various uh, techniques of optic capture in pediatric cataracts. What we used was we placed the sulcus IOL and then we uh, dialed the sulcus IOL in the, uh, we placed the sulcus multipiece IOL and then we captured the optic behind the capsule. As you can see here, behind the posterior capsule, we have captured the optic through the PPCC. Carefully using two dialers, 
as you can see here this is the optic capture being done beside the behind the uh, posterior capsule so here you can see the outlines this is your posterior capsule outline and this is your anterior capsule outline and they are forming a sandwich in front of the iol while the haptics remain in the sulcus total sample size was 21 kids between the uh, with mean age of 5.3 years and mean follow up uh, of 14.75 months there was no gender preponderance there were three dropouts one was due to deep ac in high myopia which the surgeon was a uh, surgeon was uncomfortable to do a posterior optic capture one case had a pre-existing TC dehiscence, so we did not take up for optic capture, and one case was lost to follow up. So intraoperative outcomes, the main uh, was time for uh, time taken for technique. In the bag, IOL had a moderate time for 54 to 80 seconds, which remained stable throughout the study. But posterior optic capture, which initially took a lot of time, and uh, later as the surgeon got used to the technique, it reduced. But still, it was significantly higher than in the bag IOL. Intraoperative outcomes were, uh, there were various challenges faced by the surgeon. There was one single surgeon with ex experience of uh, approximately 8 to 10 years in pediatric cataracts, and we have taken his fee her feedback. Then coming over to refractive outcomes, so initially there was high cylinder in all the cases because of the suture that we put in pediatric cases, but as later as you can see the refractive was stabilized after 6 months, and it was there was no significant difference between the two groups. There was visual access op opacification in five out of in the five in the bag IL cases and four in the posterior, uh, posterior optic capture cases. Anterior capsular phimosis was found in two cases of group one and two cases of group two. So there was basically no significant difference between the two groups in terms of implant status. Coming over to the strength of the study, we had a larger sample size as compared to other studies which have been done previously using these two techniques. And we took a subjective surgeon's feedback because the technique is as good as the surgeon who does it. Limitations were it, we had only one single operating surgeon who was doing the study, and we need a longer uh, follow up for visual access opacification score. But in terms of implant stability and visual access opacification, there was no significant difference in the fibrinous complications between the two study groups at a mean follow up of 14.7 uh, months, as compared to Sublean Cause study, which, showed, uh, which also showed similar outcomes. Then another study which compared two, uh, two techniques in a similar pattern of uh, implanting IOLs in the two eyes of the same patient, we had similar outcomes, but our surgeon found the technique of posterior optic capture more difficult and time taking. Another technique which, uh, another study which shows the refractive status outcomes, we had better uh, outcomes and no significant difference between the two groups. They also showed no significant difference between the two groups. But we also had the same amount of myopic shift in our patients at the end of the at the end of their follow up of 24 months. Conclusion: In the bag IOL is a preferred uh, technique of choice because it is easy to do, and posterior optic capture with haptics in sulcus. There are a lot of cons and can be done only in hands of experienced surgeons. Thank you. What was your follow up, Ma? How much? Uh, uh, mean was 14.7 months. The latest case which we did was a six week follow up, and the oldest one was 24 months follow up. We are still following up the cases. I suppose you need a longer follow up to really yes, come to a conclusion, yes, which, is, which would be better, right? Yes, because it's a pediatric eye. Yes, ma'am. Mm. So, here in this study, our main concern was the challenges faced during the procedure. Can it be done by everyone? Because at a later stage, it is difficult to exchange an in the bag IOL. It is easier to exchange an IOL whose haptics are in the sulcus. And IOL exchange is, a, is increasing in demand with our pediatric cataract cases as they grow up. Yeah, for the better refractive outcomes. Yes. So the next presenter is uh, Dr. Siddharth Seth. Uh, he'll be talking on visual outcomes and image quality metrics in eyes with uh, positive spherical aberration based uh, era of IOL. Yes. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Just a minute, uh, Siddharth. Uh, the next uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Abhinav Mishra, is here. Is Dr. Abhinav Mishra here? Uh, Dr. Akshay Hiramat? Yeah, so please be ready. You can uh, go ahead. Yes. Uh, so I'm Dr. Siddharth Shet. Thanks, uh, AIOS uh, Scientific Committee to, to give me an opportunity in presenting this uh, today's uh, pre paper session. So I have no financial disclosure to make. With advancement in lifestyle and gadgets, uh, requirement for unaided visual acuity at all distances has increased. 
Multifocal or trifocal IOLs are available in various uh, designs like refractive, diffractive, or refractive, diffractive designs. Refractive IOLs are pupil dependent, which causes a lot of photopsia, whereas loss of energy and thus co contrast sensitivity is the main drawback of diffractive designs. Extended depth of focus IOLs create single elongated focal point instead of multiple foci, which are seen with multifocal or trifocal IOLs. So there are various types of of IOLs available based on optical designs and mainly classified as pure of IOLs which are based on spherical abrasion or pinhole effect whereas hybrid IOLs uh, which are uh, combination of bifocality and head of. So uh, this is uh, IOL by Rayner which is Raven EMV IOL. It's a single piece uh, hydrophilic acrylic uh, lens uh, with uh, anterior uh, spheric surface inducing controlled positive spherical abrasions. So the study aim was to uh, evaluate the visual outcomes and image quality metrics in eyes implanted with positive spherical abrasion based head of IOL. It was a retrospective case series done at uh, uh, Ishanitrale Maharashtra. Uh, uh, study duration was from March to May 2023. Study uh, object uh, subjects uh, included patients implanted with this lens. Uh, and uh, 42 eyes of uh, uh, eyes of patients implanted with uh, head of IOL and 20 eyes of patients implanted with monofocal IOL as uh, comparative arm wa were included. Inclusion criteria was uh, uh, patients aged between 40 to 70 years and post-operative best corrected visual acuity better than 0.1 logma units. Uh, first eye was aimed at plano, whereas the second eye was planned for 0.5 diopter sphere. Patients with any other ocular pathologies or systemic diseases, preoperative corneal astigmatism of more than 1.5 diopters, any previous history of refractive surgery, or uh, patients with complicated or hypermature cataracts were included, uh, excluded. So uh, we evaluated at one month unaided and best corrected visual acuity for distance near at 33 centimeters and intermediate at 66 centimeters. Internal higher order abrasion and modulation transfer function, both measurements were obtained using Hoya eye test abrometer for four millimeter fixed pupil. Coming to the results, the outcome variables were post-operative uncorrected and best corrected visual acuity for uh, various distances, post-operative higher order abrasion comparison with uh, the standard monofocal lens, post-operative modulation transfer function comparison. Results, 42 eyes of patients implanted with uh, Adolf lens were analyzed. The mean stand, uh, age of the patients with uh, head of IOL was 58.61 years and the mean uh, angle of alpha was uh, 0.35. So this is the uh, slide showing the uh, visual uh, acuity. 35% uh, 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 percent, uh, uh, eyes uh, achieved six, uh, 20 by 20 vision, whereas uh, uh, almost 100% eyes uh, which uh, uh, had vis uh, un unaided visual acuity of uh, 612. For near, uh, uh, almost 36% I had uh, N6 vision, unaided uh, N6 vision, uh, whereas 100% uh, uh, I had uh, binocular uncorrected near visual acuity of N6. Intermediate near, near uh, intermediate acuity at six, 66 centimeters, uh, monocular uncorrected intermediate acuity, almost 88% showed visual acuity in the range of N8 to N12. Modulation transfer function was comparable to the standard monofocal lens. Uh, here, that, that uh, for monofocal, it is not coming. There were two cur curves, basically. Yeah, and higher order abrasion was comparis uh, comparable to the monofocal lens, except for coma, which was mo uh, uh, better uh, with Raven uh, Adolf lens, and pentafoil was better with monofocal lens. So this uh, Raven EMV lens has two zones. One is the uh, central zone, which uh, uh, gives the control spherical, uh, positive spherical abrasion, whereas the blended edge basically reduces this positive spherical abrasion and thus increases the range of focus without compromising visual acuity for low light. So uh, basically the mechanism for this lens is to induce positive spherical abrasion and bring the depth of focus better. At, uh, and not compromising the contrast. So uh, to conclude, a newer generation Adolf IOL like Raven EMV can achieve good distance near and intermediate vision with uh, mini mono vision. 
the higher order abrasions, modulation transfer function of this IOL is comparable with standard aspheric uh, monofocal IOL. So, want of time, I was not able to present a couple of slides here. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Is it a hydrophobic or a hydrophilic? This is a hydrophilic lens. Because yeah. usually most of the other ones are. Uh, yeah, hydro this is hydrophilic. The abrasions, so which machine you use? I trace, I trace, yeah. Hoya I trace. All right, thank, thank you. you. This is Dr. Abhay Hiremar. He's going to talk on comparison of subtenons with peribulbar remesthesia in manual SICS in a tertiary care center. And uh, the next presenter, Dr. Priyambada. Dr. Priyambada, are you there? Uh, Dr. Rakesh. Okay, please be ready. Yeah, good afternoon uh, uh, to all the delegates who are here. So the anesthesia technique for cataract surgery has evolved over time to reduce the risk and complications, making the anesthetic procedure safe and efficient. Regional or no local neural blockade is a preferred technique uh, for surgery, which involves blocking the nerves by uh, infiltration of uh, the area around the nerve with the local anesthetic agent. The choice of regional anesthesia for cataract surgery varies from retrobulbar, peribulbar, subtenant, subconjunctural, topical, or a combination of any of these blocks. So retrobulbar anesthesia, which was previously used, uh, was replaced by peribulbar due to uh, the complications like retrobulbar uh, hemorrhage, glow perforation. But still, uh, there might be uh, needle-related complications with peribulbar as well. So subtenance anesthesia technique has emerged as a safer and effective method without these needle-related complications. So this study aims to compare effectiveness of subtenance with peribulbar in a manual uh, small incision cataract surgery in terms of akinesia and complications. Uh, this is a prospective uh, comparative study conducted at Akash Institute, uh, Devanali. A total number of 60 patients were selected for the studies. Uh, the study was conducted after uh, taking the informed consent and uh, the patients were divided alternatively into peribulbar and subtenance group. The pre-operative -op uh, evaluation included visual acuity, a detailed anterior segment, under slit lamp and fundus examination also. Intraocular pressure, sac syringing, routine examinations like RVS, blood pressure, serology, everything was done. Uh, 30 ml a vial of 2% lidocaine with adrenaline, 1 is to 2 lakh, mixed with uh, high lays, 1,500 international units was used as an aesthetic agent. So for peribulbar group, dye was painted with 10% povidine iodine and the 3 ml of anesthetic mixture was injected using 23 gauze needle at the junction of outer one third and the inner two third of the lower orbital margin with the needle directed towards the floor of the orbit. An additional 2 ml injection was given at the supraorbital notch, eyelids were then closed and uh, intermittent pressure was applied. For the subtenance group, the site was painted and draped with aseptic conditions, lead speculum uh, was placed after installing the paracin drops. Under microscopic visualization, nick was made in the conjunctiva using a Westcott scissors inferior nasally 4 mm from the limbus. Subtenance cannula was then inserted to the bare sclera and guided along the contour of the globe till the hub of the needle touches the sclera. Using a 5 ml syringe, a uh, 3 ml anesthetic mixture, the drug was injected into the subtenance space. The time of onset of akinesia was noted and the graded based on restriction of the movements during the surgery. The complete restriction of movements in all quadrant is uh, told as grade 1. Eye movements less than 15 degree in any direction of gaze is grade 2. Eye movements more than 15 degree as grade 3. The results were the total uh, 60 uncomplicated senile cataract patients underwent uh, manual uh, cataract surgery with 30 patients in each group. All the surgeries were done by uh, two uh, senior surgeons. Most of the patients, around 78.33% were between 60 to 70 years of age. 35 patients were male and 25 were female. The time of onset of akinesia in both the groups showed a significant difference with the mean time of six plus or minus two minutes with peribulbar and 2.5 plus or minus one minute with the uh, subtenance group. However, the proportion of uh, patients with complete akinesia was significantly greater in peribulbar group with 76% than in subtenance group where 70% of the patient were having less than 15 degree eye movements. The chemosis and uh, subconjunctival hemorrhage was more in uh, subtenance anesthesia when compared to peribulbar. These were the results, uh, complication as chemosis, which was 37% uh, uh, present in peribulbar and 53% in subtenance. And subconjunctival hemorrhage, it was 13% uh, in peribulbar and 43% in subtenance. And uh, echinacea, peribulbar showed the full echinacea, uh, constituting to 77% and subtenance had less than 15 degree, around 70%. Uh, in our study, onset of echinacea was faster with the subtenance block compared to peribulbar. Uh, this was also supported by Ashok et al. And uh, only five patients in subtenance group had total echinacea and 21 patients 
had less than 15 degree in uh, peribulba group. The amount of anesthetic mixture used for peribulbar anesthesia was 5 ml for subtenance and uh, for subtenance it's 3 ml. Although the echinacea grade was lower in subtenance group, it was acceptable by the surgeon during the surgery. In this study, 53% of the patients in subtenance group had chemosis compared to 37 in the peripulbar group. However, chemosis did not interfere with the surgery, whereas uh, Park et al. did not find any significant difference in the occurrence of chemosis between the subtenance and the other peripulbar group. The occurrence of subconjunctival hemorrhage was significantly high in subtenance compared to peribulbar. Subconjunctival hemorrhage may be due to damage of subconjunctival vessels or during uh, dissection of their subtenance space and chemosis was probably due to injecting getting deposited in the wrong uh, anatomical plane. Conclusion is subtenance and peribulbar are both effective anesthesia technique uh, for manual uh, small incision cataract surgery. Though there is increase in minor complication like chemosis and SCH with subtenance compared to peribulbar, it is a safe alternative which can be used. So what would be your preference Sir, if uh, you were to operate somebody close to you? Yes, I prefer subtenance now, sir, after doing this study. In spite of the fact that you are not getting total echinacea uh, as well as the eye looks red the next day morning? Uh, that's not too much, sir. The, the only uh, quadrant where we inject that the subtenance anesthesia, only in that quadrant there will be a hemorrhage. That way not with all the patients. Yeah, that yeah, is but nowadays the patients are so sensitive that when we get a small petechial hemorrhage post uh, laser refractive surgery, they mm. get worried. Mm. So this is significant SCH so compared ex to... Explaining the patient regarding the needle-related complications as well, which might happen with peribulbar, <coughs> this is much better. Uh, convincing the patient is also important with that. What about the duration of anesthesia? So you didn't mention anything about that. How no, ma'am. Uh, we couldn't assess the uh, time uh, uh, I can assess was there because, because that would be a problem if you want to augment. No, if it is the c for some reason the surgery takes a longer time. Yes, ma'am. And if there is already a not complete I can assess and 15 percent movement is there, then that would add to the problem. Mm. So you did not uh, look into no that aspect. Yeah, because we were not hindered with anything. Good afternoon, friends and uh, respected judges. Uh, this is a small uh, uh, prospective study of clear color. Most of the time, UVIT cataracts, we are worried about our outcome and what we are exactly going to do. There is no currently approved treatment for non-infectious UVITs, which is a side-threatening, and then cataract is one of the commonest complications what we get out of this. And 50% patient, even after doing a routine cataract surgery, we come with a lot of CM and other complications. So in this patient, the visual outcome after cataract surgery is not predictable and can lead to higher post-operative inflammation. So Regarding this, what are the current options we have available is a plain cataract surgery. You just do a cataract surgery and follow this patient. Or you can do a cataract surgery and along with IVTA, which was something which was commonly done by lot, uh, many of people, but then complications like glaucomas and other things are really very high. And again, the results will not be very predictable. What we used to do routinely previously is a cataract extraction and based on the status of the fundus afterwards, we used to do a vitrectomy at a later date. The few cases now we just came out with the option available is a cataract extraction with a vitrectomy and with a sutureless vitrectomy this option has become much feasible. So we had a small study where we have done combined surgeries of the cataract with a 23 gauge vitrectomy. So all this patient had a vision from CL to almost 4 feet and it was uh, at least patient have, uh, the eye was quiet for at least 3 months. These are the standards uh, pre-operative examination done for the vision, IOP, biomedical therapy and all other pre-operative inflammation markers. Medical history, the lab investigation, what we do for routinely uveitis was routinely done for all these patients. All these patients had almost small festum pupil with some patient having a CME on the uh, UAT and then D scan was something very significant. We had a lot of vitreitic membrane or some patient even uh, little prethysis or in a cyclotic membrane also. So standard patient with synecolysis with iris hooks do a cataract extraction based on the uh, normal what you are comfortable. The significant here is to do a sutureless vitrectomy where we go remove all the membranes and then if required in such cases we have given us then ILM peeling also if there is a significant CME in which was then uh, preoperatively. So another patient with a similar UVIT cataract and all this patient had a really good post-operative outcome with a faster visual recovery. 
Yes, but we did had a few patient coming with a CMA again coming in the later date and then uh, few reaction and then glaucoma also was there. But in general, we found this technique, especially in a very bad UVIT cataract with lot of vitreous changes and then this was uh, working better compared to only giving on cataract with a IVT or rosodex injection. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is that the routinely uh, uh, practiced uh, thing where you do a vitrectomy for a UVIT cataract? Uh, not routinely for every patient, but especially some chronic or uveitic patient who comes with a repeatedly and then had a very bad chest injury with a lot of uh, membranes coming up on the B scan also, where we practically don't see the fundus or anything. So such case it is really advisable rather than doing a two-stage surgery where you do a cataract extraction and then do a vitrectomy later. So you're just uh, uh, gaining on uh, one procedure. Yes. One but what, are the, what is the flip side of it, downside of it? Uh, Did you find some complications? Uh, routinely because if you have already done a, as a I am a primary retina surgeon. If you have done a good retinal evaluation and then you are doing such surgery, then hardly any complication. But it's not advisable for a routine anterior segment surgeon to do combined procedure because you have to be really trained for a retina and do such UAT cataract. So it would be a domain of a posterior segment surgeon rather than an anterior segment surgeon or a combined approach? It's a combined approach because for a patient, it's a combined approach rather than you do a cataract again, wait for eye to be quiet for at least six weeks to three months, then decide of doing a vitrectomy and uh, do it. So it's a long, lengthy so the recovery for the patient. But the exercise of counseling the patient would start from you are going for a posterior segment procedure also. So yes. you have to explain everything. Yes. yes. So you didn't uh, come across any complication no. as such? Because my recovery phase was much faster. Rather than giving a repeated steroids or other injection with one procedure, I could have a good recovery for all these patients. Okay. Did Thank you do you. any comparative study? Because this uh, basically it is a non-infection, the UIT cataract was relatively a very small population. So what we had compared is a compared with the existing literature, rather than we have not done a randomized trial for a comparatively body. What was the sample size? Right now, just I have done a 12 uh, eyes of the nine patients, but then I am now thinking of combining with the vitrectomy and now with the ozodex with some patients rather than triumphs alone, maybe with the intravital the ozodex because that is something which we can do with anterior segment surgery also can plan. Instance of glaucoma or following triamcinone injection? Almost quite high with intravital. Subtinin I didn't see much because again what uh, triamcinone you are using commercially because if you are using a ready-made uh, triamcinone what is available not of with what we are getting with uh, ophthalmic preparation, yes that was very high. And then again that what site you are giving uh, superiorly or if you are giving inferiorly. So that also was matter for the glaucoma patient. Follow-up was done for how many days? Almost how now these patients are uh, uh, the last patient from six months, last one year we have done this follow-up now. September 22. So there are no spikes? No. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So the next uh, presenter is going to be Dr. Maunika. Yeah. She's going to talk on uh, simple and safe, a prospective study comparing results of PRK in high and low myopic patients. Uh, Dr. Aisha. Yeah. yeah. So please be ready. You're next. Yes, Maunika, you can start. Problem? Yes, ma'am. My QVB is not uploaded. Mm. Technical AV people, could you? We're presenting on a case report of this patient who presented to us with small hands and smaller le lens. Now, coming to the study, there's no financial interest involved. Uh, coming to the introduction, the purpose of this uh, case report was to report a case of Wheel Marchesani syndrome. So the clinical history, basically a 42-year-old female patient presented to our OPD with complaints of diminution of vision since three years, which was painless in nature, in serious in onset, and gradually progressive. And what was interesting about this case was that the patient also gave history of stiff joints in the hands and fingers, which was almost in the same duration, which was of three years. There was no history of any diplopia flashes or floaters. There was no history of any ocular trauma or previous ocular surgeries. No history of any photophobia and patient is a known case of hypertension since three years. Now moving on to the ocular examination, in the right eye the vision was uh, counting fingers at half meter, there was no pinhole improvement. The rest of the lid and necks are conjunctiva and the cornea were within normal limits, the sclera was normal and the anterior chamber was of normal depth. The pupil was 3 mm, uh, round and reactive, the lens showed senile immature cataract of great nuclear sclerosis 1. but. Uh, inferotemporal subluxation of the lens. 
and in the left side the vision was counting fingers close to face there was no pinhole improvement again lid side necks are conjunctiva and cornea and sclera were within normal limits the anterior chamber was of normal depth the pupil was 3 mm in size and then the lens showed senile immature cataract of great nucleus sclerosis 3 with inferior temporal subluxation of the lens so both the eyes had in inferior temporal subluxation and uh, the extraocular movements in the right eye were within normal limits uh, normal in all cases uh, the intraocular pressure which was uh, measured with Glo goldman's affination tonometry was 16 mm hg the gonioscopy showed angles of shaffer's grade 2 so slightly narrow angles uh, the fundus examination in the right eye showed uh, the disc having uh, a cup disc ratio of 0.7 and there was also inferior and temporal thinning which was present and the rest of the retinal examination was normal and the schirmer's test in the right eye showed 7 mm and the but was 4 uh, seconds in the left eye the extraocular movements were all normal in all the cases the intraocular pressure was 18 mm hg again gonioscopy showed uh, narrow angles with chaffer's grade 2 the fundus again with similar findings of cup disc ratio of 0.7 with inferior and temporal thinning and the peripheral retina was within normal limits and uh, the schirmer's test was 6 mm and tbert showed a uh, dry eye with 3 seconds now these were the findings that we got as you can see in the right eye there was inferior temporal subluxation of the lens with the ns1 grade and in the left eye there was ns3 with inferior temporal subluxation now coming to the general physical in examination what was interesting to note was that this patient had short stature and she was of height of 4 feet 2 inches she was moderately built and there was brachydactyly of the fingers and the toes uh the rest of the general physical examination was normal the systemic examination was within normal limits now these are the pictures as you can see the patient was of uh, short stature there is brachydactyly of the fingers and the toes um now this is the right eye fundus examination the left eye fundus we could not take the image as the media was hazy due to cataract now moving on to the management that was considered for this patient because of the general physical examination we were considering a connective tissue disorder but the blood work up showed that all the exam uh, sorry all the tests were within normal limits so what is to be noted is the serum homocysteine level was within normal limits the cardiac echo was also normal and chest x ray and ecg were within normal limits uh so we excluded the common differential diagnosis which we usually have with uh, ectopia lentis like uh, marfan syndrome heller danlos syndrome um there was cruzon syndrome was also like uh, ruled out uh so the patient was diagnosed with what could be possibly wheel marchesani syndrome because these people present with brachydactyly and also uh, with uh, secondary glaucomas which was seen in this patient there was also dry eye uh, in this patient um so the patient was uh, diagnosed as a wheel marchesani and patient was planned for uh, lens extraction of both the eyes with anterior vitrectomy and iris flow implantation and patient underwent these surgeries and the vision improved to 6 12 in the right eye on two weeks follow up and 6 18 in the left eye and the patient was also started on anti glaucoma neuroprotective agent uh, which was brimonidin and the patient was referred to orthopedic management for the systemic management of pain and stiffness in the hands and the fingers that she had so now discussion although it is a very rare entity wheel marchesani syndrome should be considered as in this patient the cardiac findings were normal but the only thing to be noted was the patient had short stature and short toes and short uh, fingers so a lot of times this can be missed out so it should be kept in mind now, now the genetic counseling also can be done with autosomal dominant uh, genes that has been studied in the previous studies being fbn1 and the autosomal recessive ones being adam ts and adam ts uh, 10 17 and ltb p2 genes thank you corneal diameter so the corneal diameter was within normal limits normal limits yes and there was no microsterophysia also in this patient it was pseudomatous that's why we considered the other differential diagnosis yes, otherwise yes, the phenotype or the habitus is yes. more in consistency with the wilma chisani yes ma'am okay thank, thank you. you so dr monica are you ready yeah please come over the next presenter is going to good afternoon everyone Uh, i am dr monica today my case study is on uh, photorefractive keratectomy uh, compared between two groups of low to moderate myopes versus high myopia uh, coming to the procedure photorefractive keratectomy is a photoablation procedure in which ultraviolet 
beam generated by 193 uh, nanometer of organ fluoride eczema laser is irradiated to the corneal stroma after the epithelial removal to reshape the anterior corneal stroma to correct hematropia. The newest generation wavelength uh, 500 Hz high frequency eczema laser is safe and excellent effectively treat high myopia with LASIK. So my aims and objectives. My primary uh, objective is to compare visual outcomes of photorefractive keratectomy in low to moderate versus high myopes. The secondary objective is to compare postoperative complications in low to uh, moderate versus high myopes and to compare the advantage of PRK over the other refractive surgeries. Material and, and methods. This is a retrospective comparative study was conducted for one year. All the patients were informed with written consent. Inclusion criteria, age greater than 21 years and staple refractive error not greater than 0.5 after change for not less than six months. And myopia with spherical power ranging from po minus 0.5 adapters to uh, 10 adapters and astigmatism of minus 4 adapters were taken into the criteria. Exclusion, age less than 20 years, spherical power greater than 12 adapters and ectactic disorders, no systemic or autoimmune disorders and ocular morbidities and severe dry eye were excluded. Preoperative evaluation protocol, um, uncorrected, uncorrected uh, visual acuity, manifest and cycloplegic refraction, corneal topography by Sirius was done and slit lamp, uh, intraocular IOP measurement, fundus examination, and we have taken a, any history of contact lens usage for the past six months. Sample size was ca calculated by using a paired t-test. So post-operative uh, uh, regimen, post-operative medications were 0.5% moxifloxin hourly for three days, then four times per day for two weeks. After that, patient was asked to stop the uh, antibiotics, followed by 1% prednisolone acetate suspension six times per day for three days, then four times per day for four weeks. Subsequently, patient is sh shifted to 0.1% fluoromethylone four times per day for three months. Along with that, copious amounts of lubricants and oral analytics were prescribed. Bandage contact lens were removed up, uh, depending upon the epithelialization. Follow up, patient was followed up on day three, one and three, seven, and one month, three months and 12 months post-operatively. Uh, the following things are assessed. Uncorrect dis uncorrected uh, distant visual acuity and corrected distance visual acuity. Slit lamp examination and post-operative mean refractive spherical equivalent, corneal topography and IOP. Measurements were taken at uh, one third and 12 months respectively, and dilated fundoscopy was performed at 3rd and 12 months. Results, a total of 224 eyes of post-PRK were reviewed. Uh, of them, 48 eyes were high myopes, and 176 eyes were low to moderate my myopes. Of the 66 were male, and 46 were female. So uh, this is the post-operative data. The efficacy index at 12 months post-operative surgery was not significantly different between the two groups. And predictability, we didn't uh, notice a much predictable insignificant between the two groups. It was um, at the end of 12 months, we have noticed an MRSE of within uh, one diopter at the end of 12 months. Stability, uh, there is no much difference between the stability uh, between the two groups. Safety index at 12 months post-operative PRK, no one lost a more than two lines of Snell lens, corrected distance visual acuity, and there is no uh, insignificant between the two groups. Post-operative complications, patients who were with high myopes, only few patients among the 48 A's, uh, three, uh, three, uh, three patients experienced in, uh, night vision syndromes like glare and halos, which was, uh, which was decreased by the end of 12 months. Corneal haziness and dry eye were not much significantly noted in two groups. Discussion, this study demonstrated that 12 months outcome of high myopic correction by PRK was safe and effective and safe compared with those of low to moderate. The efficacy index and safety index of PRK was excellent for both, both groups. Our analysis of 12 months outcome of high myopic PRK with wavelength EX 500 eczema laser resulted in excellent UDVA and low rate of complications. So most of the patients have previously used to experience some amount of uh, ectasia with the recent wavelength, uh, wavelength X 500 uh, laser, th there is a decreased chances of ectasia. And moreover, we are using a 0.2% of 0.02% of mitomycin by usually 10 seconds per adapter, not greater than for 40 seconds. So post-operative glare and halo, halos were also decreased along with the post-operative haze is also dec decreased. Advantages compared to LASIK with recent PRK technique, haze is relatively less due to the use of mitomycin. Time is up, please. Mitomycin C, compared to uh, fakey chivals, if the patient uh, anterior chamber depth is inadequate, inadequate, we can go for the PRK. So my limitations of the study is contrast sensitivity and higher, uh, higher order aberrations were not assessed. However, all myopic patients were satisfied with the surgical results. These are my references. Thank you. How many patients did you see, Hayes? Sir, uh, 
like uh, in high myops uh, only four patients have little hazer where the patients recovered by three months sir we have accelerated the dose of steroids sir what is the reason why you used uh, prid acetate for the first four weeks because in order to subside the inflammation sir and to decrease the haze we have done thousands of cases of prk and we never used uh, prid acetate uh, uh, lotiprednol should be more than sufficient. It's important that you use the uh, steroid for a longer time as compared to uh, conventional LASIK. But uh, pred acetate in the initial period, especially when the epithelium is off, uh, should be considered a higher risk. And also for four weeks, uh, I don't recommend it. Okay, sir. The uh, third thing is, uh, what did you do differently as compared to low myopes? Uh, normally, we notice that uh, more than six diopters, uh, unless you you did something different to prevent haze, or it was a common procedure. How do you explain that? Sir, we have uh, we have increased the duration of mitomycin C, sir, application. Usually, it is around 10 to 20 seconds. For high, uh, when it is greater than six diopters, we have applied the mitomycin C for uh, 40 seconds, sir. You mentioned 10 seconds per diopter. Yes, so madam. But it's not. Diopter, it's going to be 40. Uh, but it's not more than 40 seconds, madam. So even 10 diopter is going to be 40. So you have not made it any different as such. Okay. Isn't it? That's what I'm trying to tell. Okay. And what type of PRK was it? Uh, was it a trans or a? No, madam. Uh, a like routine? few we have done trans PRK where the results were in that good. So we didn't. Trans include didn't it. give you good results. Good results, madam. Meaning to say the post-op visual recovery? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And little bit of haze is also experienced by the patients, madam. That's why we stopped doing trans PRK. That's one thing. Second thing, you didn't mention anything about the PACI cutoff. What was your PACI range for? Even for 10 diopters, you are going for a PRK. So what was the PACI that was acceptable for you? Uh, 400 microns, madam. You mean residual stromal wear? Yes, ma'am. That would be 300, probably. 300 mm -hmm. plus another. I would say 350 probably. Yeah, yeah. Post. Uh, 350, 400 rupees difference. Sir? Yeah. No cases were there in post-op glaucoma? Uh, no, sir. We have because not you noticed. Spread no? Yes, sir. Along with the, if we, uh, if and some patients we have started on AGMs also sir, simultaneously. If we are using steroid, like prednisolone acetate for longer duration, we have put on timolol eye drops, sir. Without uh, measuring? Or we uh, have measured it, sir. Upon that, yeah, we have added to prevent glaucoma. No, some, something would have, uh, you know, prompted you to use that. Probably you would have seen a myopic reading on the post-op AR or something, would, or if it was a very high myope and a borderline cornea, then you are suspecting a, your NCT is a routine, isn't it? You yes, take an yes, NCT. Yes, So based on that, you would have probably started off. Or was it a routine to start for high myopes and anti glaucoma? No, no, nothing like that, madam. After noting the NCT, if we feel that there is a bit high end, then we are starting it and asking the patient to follow up within 15 to uh, 15 days or one month, madam. What is the duration of your steroid therapy? Sir, steroid, sir. No, for uh, low myopes and uh, high myopes? Low myopes? The same? Or like or no, sir. For first two weeks, we have used 1% prednisolone acetate, sir like uh, four times after that we have shifted to fluoromethylone sir for yeah. high myopes we have used but fluoromethylone how, how long you are given uh, we have given for a period of two months sir for low myopes yes sir for high myopes high myopes first we have given uh, for one month of prednisolone acetate we have given four one times per <laughs> too toxic so cataract we think twice <laughs> <laughs> i'm surprised anyway. i think the important thing for you to remember is more than um, anything else to prevent haze yes, sir. is to see that there is compliance regarding the treatment. First of all, steroids should never be missed. Okay, the second yes, thing is I'll always ask them to wear a UV protective goggles for the first six months. Okay, sir. Third thing, I don't know its usefulness, but uh, using uh, chilled BSS during the time of washing may be to some extent uh, useful in preventing the haze. I feel that um, mitomycin, uh, not more than one minute in any case yeah. should be used. Maybe for very low powers, you would use for a lesser time, but not more than one minute. Uh, yes, sir. Even if it is greater than six diopters, the maximum amount of time we have used is 40 seconds only, sir. Yeah, not to use thing, just out of curiosity. Did you do a post, uh, what was your follow-up? 12 months, ma'am. 12 months. So have you repeated your uh, 
pentacam after that to see for the for those high myopes how has their uh, recovery yeah, yes i have done madam so ah. for 6 months and 12 months i have repeated madam so you find it uh, good uh, yes mm -hmm. one more thing is you mentioned astigmatism of four diopters yes sir i i to believe that prk all acts equally well for higher degrees of astigmatism but there is some controversy did you get any cases of regression no, especially sir. when you are using or a hyperopic shift when you are doing higher degrees of astigmatism no sir PRK. i haven't noted because many of the mm -hmm. surgeons refractive surgeons i have noticed is they don't prefer to correct higher uh, degrees of astigmatism okay. with prk they prefer a femtolasic rather than a uh, but i personally prefer because of the risk of ectasia whatever it is uh, many times in high uh, astigmatic cases there will be some points which you miss on topography and ultimately they come out so i personally prefer that prk is a safer procedure for higher astigmatic patients pure astigmatism okay. but did you in your case get any hyperopic shift or no, regression no, in such case sir maximum ablation sir sorry sir maximum ablation how much uh, ablation for high myopes 60 to 80 micron sir no highest 60 70 100 yeah, because you said you are telling Thank you, sir. Thank you. Sir Niranjan here. Dr. Niranjan. Over to you, Dr. Sumlapta. You can start. Good afternoon, one and all. So today's my topic is cataract surgeries postponed on the day of surgery, which we have already selected them. and on the surgery on the day of surgery they got cancelled so it's a small pilot study so why i have done this study because it is a point of interest in tertiary care hospitals our is a tertiary care hospital where we bring lots of cases through cams or through opd whatever it is we bring post cases about 30 to 35 cases and among them on the day of surgery at least 5 to 7 cases will get cancelled so to avoid all this just we have made a uh, study so that we can uh, streamline our uh, uh, cataract surgeries so aim of the study to evaluate and report causes for cancellation of cataract surgery on the day of surgery in patients posted for surgery so why we need to do this surgery when a case was cancelled money is potentially wasted on unnecessary setups while doing camps bringing the patients to the hospital doing all preoperative evaluations our postgraduates will be doing lots of work preoperative investigations cst slit lamp examination everything and uh, then and to prevent a negative impact that a case cancellation has on, on the patient relatives and staff cancellations also have potentially severe financial implications on hospital operations so improving the proper preoperative systemic evaluation of cases and preoperative proper ophthalmic examination definitely will reduce postponing the cases on the day of surgery implementations of quality improve, uh, improvement strategies have also been shown to decrease the cancellation rates so our main objective of this study was to assess the reasons of cancellation of cataract surgery identify the modifiable barriers to complete the surgery on the day of scheduled date and educational experiences for the post graduates that are lost as a result of cancellations so it is just an analytical observational study which is the duration is from september 21st to uh, december to 2021 so it's a it's a was a tertiary care hospital so ethical considerations the study was done after obtaining ethical uh, sorry ethical committee clearance so these are the inclusion and exclusion criteria we have taken the consent from the patient and we don't have any financial interest So first camps were conducted, or all, uh, and uh, according to the schedule, every month there will be a schedule. Patients were shifted uh, who are prior uh, seen by post graduates at camps, and they were shifted to the hospital. Thorough history will be taken by the post graduates, slit lamp examination, and uh, will be done by the senior residents. Uh, Preoperative investigations were conducted on the day of admission itself. So at this stage, what we have, we some cases were cancelled due to some acute anterior segment pathologies or some abnormal investigations like increased intraocular pressures or there is some vitreous uh, vitreous or retinal pathologies. 
So we we started out few cases here uh, in every camp. So after that admission was done at this stage, systemic evaluation will be done on the next day of the admission. So patients with abnormal uh, systemic uh, values or abnormal systemic conditions like cardiac history or any high hypertension, all those cases will be sorted or we are sorted at this stage after admissions all these patients were sent out, sent back to their places without doing surgery. So remaining cases were posted on the surgery. So on the day of surgery, most of the patient uh, cataract surgeries were canceled, mostly due to increased ra random levels or diabetes or due to increased blood pressure. So it's a simple uh, descriptive analytical study, so not much to do with any statistical analysis. We have just taken the percentages. So total uh, 625 cases were done during the period of four months. Among them, 94 cases, a percentage of 15.04 were canceled due to various causes. So among this, the most common is hyper, uh, sorry, uh, RT-PCR positive because during that time it was a COVID period and followed by diabetes is the most common cause for cancellation of cataract. So other special conditions are one case on table it was cancelled because of scleral perforation which was done by a postgraduate and also retrobulbar hemorrhage is one more common cause. So this is the month wise distribution of calculations, uh, sorry cancellations and this is also the male and female preponderance of cancellation of cataract surgeries. So case cancellation is defined as those procedures that were cancelled either on the day of surgery that was scheduled or the previous day or cases that appeared in a definitive schedule list that ultimately were not performed. So, so an efficient ophthalmic uh, service should have a low rate of cancellation of cataract accordingly, but most of the cases were cancelled. Schofield and colleagues who examined data from an elective surgery performed at a major hospital found 17.1% of cataract cancels and Henderson and colleagues about 24%. So our limitations or estimated facility, uh, fa facility and financial implications were not included in this study. And uh, this uh, preoperative pre-admission testing is very, very important if you want to just uh, reduce the cancellation rate. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. This is the paucity of time. So we'll move on to the next topic. Uh, yeah, he's going to talk on a randomized trial between uh, Moria's technique of uh, nucleus hydroexpression versus visco expression in MSICS. Uh, good afternoon, respected judges. So my study is on a randomized clinical trial between Moria's technique of nucleus hydroexpression versus visco expression in M6. So cataract surgery has evolved from an ECC to M6, FACO, and now FLAX and robotic surgeries. And all surgical procedures has a complication rate. And the goal and challenge for ophthalmic surgeons are to minimize them. An elective cataract surgery is associated with some endothelial cell loss, which is of particular concern as they cannot regenerate. In FACO, it is the loss is 8 to 25 percent, whereas in M6, 4 to 16 percent is observed. And there are various uh, studies that have compared M6 versus FACO, but none had compared during the different steps of M6. So this was a first prospective randomized trial to analyze and compare the endothelial cell loss during M6 cataract surgery uh, using the viscoelastic assisted nucleus removal versus the Moria's technique of nucleus hydroexpression with basal salt solution plus. Uh, so we noticed the uh, demography, uncorrected distant visual acuity, and best corrected visual acuity post-operatively, pre and post-op intraocular uh, pressure, change in CCT, and pre and post-op changes in keratometry at day one and day 90. So it was a prospective randomized trial of 204 patient and single surgeon performed all these surgeries uh, in both the groups. Inclusion criteria, more than 5.5 millimeter of midriasis, no central corneal opacity, no previous surgery, ECD of more than 2000, and group A nucleus removal using the OVD, 2% HPMC, 101 cases, and group B nucleus removal using Moria's three-way hydrocannula and BSS plus, so there were 103 cases. So this was the design of the beveled up hydrocannula with uh, the central large opening and two sideways openings, so there is no uh, shallowness of the AC. So this is the design of the Moria's hydrocannula. So this is a case of uh, nucleus removal using OVD. So prolapse into the AC and it is removed. And this is a case of uh, again SICS in which the nucleus is removed using the uh, three-way hydro Moria's cannula.
So it is stuck in the, and with the swivel moment, it is removed. It's such a large nucleus. So these were the results. The mean age of the patient was 64 plus minus 8.2 years. So there was no difference in both the groups regarding the demographies and the associated systemic illnesses. The mean logmar visual acuity for both groups uh, on day one and day 90 was statistically significant with p-value of less than 0 0.001, but it, there was no difference in both the groups. Change in intraocular pressure from pre-operative to post-operative day one and day 90 in group one was 0.7% and 8.7%, and in Moria's technique, uh, it was 2.7 and 7.5%. Endothelial cell loss of 9.7% with the OVD group and only 4.8% in the Moria's technique of nucleus removal. Regarding the pre and post of CCT, K1, K2, no significant p-value difference. So iatrogenic surgical trauma to endothelium result in PBK and a gross reduction in visual acuity. And previous studies have compared ECD loss during FACO or compared between FACO and SICS. So we compared two techniques of nucleus removal using OVD and R technique. So this prospective randomized trial proves that like during PCR implantation, BSS plus can again be used for nucleus delivery with endothelial protective effect. Also. The IOP was also decreased. This was an accidental finding of up to 7 to 8% after M6, and it remained uh, sustained for one year. So as per our knowledge, this is the first large-scale analysis highlighting the pachymetric, intraocular pressure, and endothelial cell changes during the nucleus removal by the two different nucleus removal techniques of a small incision cataract surgery. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Uh, Dr. Arvind. Just one question, uh, what was the purpose of the three openings? What was the thought behind the process? Yeah, so the thought was, so that there was, when we remove the nucleus, so, so there is no AC prolapse. So if sideways, if the fluid is coming out, so there is no nucleus prolapse. Does that also help in levitating the nucleus? Yeah, it helps, it helps. Because two are directed towards the side yeah. and one is directed yeah. superior. Yeah. So Definitely my thought goes that it probably helps in levitating the nucleus Definitely. and pushing it out. It engages in the uh, tunnel so quite easily and removal is by the civil method. Yes, of Thank course. You. Thank you, sir.